to Provo Congregational Community, United Church of Christ. And this we want to be at Provo Community Congregational United Church of Christ. Anyway, we answer to that title also, those titles also. Welcome on this first Sunday of Christmas Tide. It's also the fifth of six Sundays in our current emphasis, which is Companies Coming. And today we're focusing on the theme of enjoying the company, princess that has come in the princesses. We're glad that you were here. Trust that you had a wonderful Christmas. We had wonderful services on Christmas Eve. And I am just flabbergasted at uh, the response. I was convinced that no one would come at five minutes until seven. There were only just a few of us here that we were all had a part in the service. And then they came. 70 plus people adorned the sanctuary, properly distanced, of course, all wearing masks, of course. And it was a joyous time. At 11 o'clock, same thing, five minutes till 11. I don't think anybody's coming. <coughs> and then they came. Over 30 people joined us in that service, and many, many more on Facebook. Thank you for joining us today <coughs> on this live feed on Facebook. God is just so good all the time, and all the time God is good. <coughs> A couple of announcements uh, for today, and uh, that is that uh, next week will be the last Sunday of, of Christmas time, and also <coughs> sun, uh, Sunday of our current series. Then two weeks from today will be Epiphany, that's the season when we celebrate that the wise men finally get here. <laughs> and then that leads us, <coughs> excuse me, up to Lent. Now, don't be too concerned about my cough. It's very irritating to have to listen to it. But I got this, this sinus blockage, and when the mucus in there won't come out my nose or down my, whatever that is, and out my mouth, it, uh, I just have to cough for a while, so thank you for your indulgence. All right, council meeting uh, is... Uh, going to be held on January the 20th. That's uh, coming up. We'll keep announcing that. And on February the 7th, we'll have our congregational meeting, our annual meeting, when we uh, go over the year's reports. Now, let's see. The choir is on hiatus, and we are moving ever closer <coughs> to launching our marvelous effort of fundraising to uh, Spruce up the building, starting with the roof and moving on. Now, Christmas Eve, if taught me anything, it has taught me that God is faithful and obedient. It's not that I needed to learn it again, except that I needed to learn it again. And in learning it again, God says, Now, I told you they'd come, they came, etc., etc. Now, God has called us into this place over 100 years ago and into this location right on Main Street, two blocks north of the center of town. Now, God has said, I'm sending you people who will assist you to restore And then God has said, God's going to send us the people that will restore the population. I'm saying, Lord, it is not possible. I don't know if you've ever said that, but I was saying that. Now, here's what I like about God. God rolls up God's sleeves and says, watch this. <laughs> Happened on Christmas Eve. It's going to happen. Three million dollars. Yeah, it's going to happen. Coronavirus finally going to be open. People going to finally make their way back to church. 50, 100, 200 people going to happen. I don't know how, but I know that God has rolled up God's sleeve. Hope you'll be a part of it. Oh, with the... Uh, 
live stream from Christmas Eve, 7 and 11 o'clock. Depending on how many persons were watching each one of those individual, whatever, can't even think of a word, I'm sorry. Yes, it broadcasts. We could have had almost a thousand people participating in all of those services. Oh, it blows me away. So, again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for celebrating this marvelous season. And, Lord, thank you for giving us the blessing. All right, as we do move more fully into the service, Focusing today primarily on Simeon and Anna. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Then Simeon, who lived a life of listening, became a teacher of the song he knew. He sang into the hearts of those who came caring more than they knew. His song was a gift to the church. Called the new the Matisse. From the first words of, of the song in Latin, now let your servant depart in peace. We call ourselves into worship. David? Brothers and sisters in Christ, as we participate now in the lighting of the Christ candle, I say to you, the baby born is the light of the world. We light the candles of peace, of hope, of joy, of love, and of life. Christ is born, the holy child. Play the old bow and bagpipes merrily. Christ, Christ is born, born, the holy child. child. 
sing we all of the Savior mighty. Jesus, Lord of all the world, coming as a child among us. We are sinners. Whether our sin is as obvious as our failure to uphold and express the generosity of your ways, or for the sly sins which are, excuse me, which as yet we have not recognized and brought into your light. And so, dear friends, hear the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thank you. Lord Glory to God. God. Amen. Our hymn is two verses of the Christmas carol, the first, Noel. David reminded me just recently that Noel literally means news. So we are going to be proclaiming the first news. David? <laughs>
we prepare for the scripture and the home. Let us pray for illumination. Lord, as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, grant us grace that we may open our ears and open our minds to receive the message, the word that you have for us today. For we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God's people say, I want to specifically read today from Isaiah and from Luke. The passage from Isaiah is chapter 61, beginning with verse 10 and going through chapter 62, verse 3. Now chapters 60 through 62, many scholars believe, are directly related to Isaiah 40 through 55. You will remember that Isaiah 40 through 55 deal with the suffering servant motif. There are four strophes or four songs of the suffering servant. And it's a brand new theology presented to Israel by the prophet Isaiah. And in this new teaching, we, God's people, take on the sins of the world. We suffer for those who cause suffering. Revolutionary. And we do that as we follow the Messiah who comes to suffer for us. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son, and who believes in the Son shall not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. And this captures the motif. God chooses to suffer for us. And in the realm of blessed to be a blessing, that would be Genesis 12. We who have been suffered for take on the mantle of suffering. Now, as we have dealt with those 15 chapters, 40 to 55, we again take up this theme in Isaiah 60 through 62. Specifically today, we are dealing with chapter 61, beginning with verse 10, which says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, my whole being shall exalt in my God. For God has clothed me with the garments of salvation, God has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself out with a garland and a bride adorns herself with jewels. As for the earth, excuse me, for as the earth brings forth its shoots and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see vindication and all the kings of your, and all the kings your glory, O Lord, and you shall be called by a new name mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diamond in the hand of your God. May God add the blessing to the reading of this portion of God's Word. Let us pray. Now, O Lord, uphold thee as I have privilege to uplift thee. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I said that we're going to be reading from Isaiah and Luke. We'll come to Luke in just a moment. But we need to set the stage. And in setting the stage, what we are to 
sudden is the fact that, that we have been called for a particular purpose. But when God created the heavens and the earth and everything was good, it was just heaven and, and earth were intermingled. And then, when the man and the woman chose to be disobedient, and then chose to not be responsible for the disobedience, you remember, they said, it's not my fault. The man said, it's a woman's fault, the woman's fault said, it's a serpent's fault, the serpent didn't say nothing. Then, heaven and earth were torn apart. The man and woman needed to leave the garden. And we discover that on the outside of the garden, that there are people. The man and woman leave the garden, they have sons, Cain and Abel, Cain kills his brother, and then Cain is sent over to Nam. And the fun part of biblical exegesis is well, where did they come from? I haven't ever been able to ask that question. I'm going to take Bible 101 up in heaven one of these days, and I'm going to find out to answer that question. But they were there. And they were there to characterize the fact that they received a visitor. Cain, and that visitor had the mark of God so that God was protecting Cain even though Cain, just like his parents, not only committed sin, murder, killed his brother, but he said, it's not my fault. Therefore, why did he have to be protected? Because they who already practiced these qualities of life practiced the fact that they were suspicious of outsiders and generally needed to kill them or run them off. Such is the definition of darkness. Such is the definition of life outside the parameters of God. So fast forward to Abram, and Abram was called. In essence, God says, I want to bless you. And should you receive the blessing, you become a blessing. That's all there is to this. You are to understand the blessing, and then as you bless, as you are blessed, you will be explaining to the world, living before the world, a life that Paul would call becomes the gospel. A life that will say, come out of the darkness into the light. Come out of the chaos into the order. Come into the presence of God. Now the world has as its base a resistance to that. At our base, the culture says, Okay, we've got to take care of ourselves and we don't have to take care of anybody else. And everybody else is trying to, to take what we have away and so we have to be suspicious of everyone and we live in this kind of generalized world. When I was a kid growing up, we never locked our house now. We lock everything. At least in most instances. I'm fine for those little things. But then as, as, as Abram has Isaac and Isaac has Jacob and, and each one of these have been have received the promise of the covenant and then Jacob the old bragger himself the old con man himself has an encounter with God wrestles with God similar to what I was wrestling with God on Christmas Eve and then gets a new name and gets a new identity. Israel. And so, so to be a child of Israel is to be in the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and he turns into Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And what is our purpose? Blessed to be a blessing. We are to be a light. We are to show the world. And so 
Fast forward into, into the conquest of the promised land. Had to get through Egypt before that. And now we are going to set up shop and be the light so that the world will come and discover the essence, the heart, the soul, the mind, and the strength of God. Israel liked the job. They like the perch. But old sin just kind of creeps in there and, and before too long they were just wearing all the trappings of salvation. They were just wearing all the trappings of righteousness. They were just wearing all the trappings of holiness. They were just wearing all the trappings of light. And underneath was just darkness. One of the reasons why clergy in, in many judicatories wear these robes is to hide our worldliness. We are clothing ourselves with righteousness to hide our worldliness. So if you want to know what worldliness looks like, it looks like this. So what happens if all I ever do is just put on the garments? But I never become the meaning and message of the garments. What if I say, I am blessed and I will be a blessing to you, except in these circumstances? What if I say, I will love my enemy, except in these circumstances? What if I say that you owe me and I'm not responsible for any pain that I cause you? but you are responsible for all of my pain, then we would have put on the righteousness of God and behave unrighteous. Church just calls that sin. So how are you dressed today? How are your righteous clothes feeling today? What's in your heart? What's in your soul? What's in your mind? Same question you can ask me and should ask me. When we come face to face with our sin, as Isaiah was inviting Jerusalem and Israel to become face or to come face to face with their sin, it wasn't that the, the teaching was wrong, it was that the practice was suspect. for my joy and my pain to hear from someone of such stature as Isaiah that I now have to start suffering for them. I'm guessing it didn't go over very well, but Isaiah didn't care. He said, if you come back, if you come into your senses, if you're willing to, to work at combining earth and heaven. If you're willing to figure out how to integrate them, then wherever you are will be where the imminent and transcendent merge. That's what Christmas was all about. The birth of Christ was all about. And that's stable. Heaven and earth were so intricately intertwined that we couldn't tell which one was which. It was just holy. So Isaiah says, here's what's going to happen. We've got 40 through 55, and now, sometimes later, sometime later, he says, all right, I want, to, I want you to see what I see. I want you to hear what I hear. He says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for the reasons in which the earth blossoms and springs forth, for the reasons that a bride and bridegroom are happy, Jerusalem be happy. For you who have taken seriously the commandments of God, the covenant of God, the gospel of God, 
You have taken that seriously. You're vindicated. You're restored. And the world can see it. This is not about the world will be the path to our gates to give us all of their wealth and riches and say, you take care of us, you rule us, we're, we're your servants. That's not it. That's what we have to be saved from. That's what we have to be vindicated from. No, the world will come and say, this is what God is all about. This is what right living is all about. This is what holiness is all about. They shall see your vindication and all the kings you dwell with. And you will be called by a new name at the mount of the Lord will give you. What is that name? Huh? That's right. Emmanuel. God with us. People of integrity. God is with us. People who Say what they mean and mean what they say. When they say, we will love the Lord God with our hearts, all minds, and strength, and we will love our neighbors with ourselves. That's our new name. It's an old name, but it's a new name. And you, individually and collectively, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord. And a royal diadem. Remember the man and the woman invited to leave the garden? Do you think that they could have been called a crown of beauty? Do you think they could have been called a royal diadem? No! They may have manufactured those titles to feel good about themselves. They couldn't be called those titles. Isaiah says, but you can't be called the crown of beauty, royal diet. Because you know that as important and as prestigious as the blessing is, the great reality is that when we pay that far, when we become the blessing, as we have been blessed, miracles happen. Healing happens. Wholeness happens. Righteousness. We can be in each other's presence unafraid. Now Jerusalem and Israel had a habit. I think it's pretty much like our habit in this generation. Our habit here at Provo Community Congregation on Church of Christ. Our habit. And that is, we get really going and we get really inspired and then they kind of let it lapse. And that light begins to dim. We're still dying, we're still crown, but there nobody's keeping them polished. They're dull. And so, the voice of Isaiah needs to ring again. And that voice rang at the birth of Jesus. All the things that God had said gets integrated into the life of Jesus. The birth of Jesus starts it off. And as I have suggested to you, heaven and earth were reunited in that state. Heaven and earth was reunited when the angels sang to the shepherds. Heaven and earth were reunited when, if what I believe is, has any truth, the village of Bethlehem turned out to help Mary and Joseph give birth and to celebrate the birth of their child. We weren't looking for what we could get. We were grateful for what we were able to experience. And in turn, gave it right back. So now it comes time for Jesus to be purified, for him to be dedicated. So we 
turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 22, and following. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. They brought him to Bethlehem and, and left him. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law. They were poor. So the law says a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him. He was looking for the vindication, the restoration of Israel from being all hat and no cattle, from being really nice looking clothes on the outside and be kind of poor and, and nothing on the inside. He was looking for that vindication that the clothing inside and out matched. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents, Mary and Joseph, brought the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon walked over, took him into his arms, imagine Mary shock, and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your words, for I have seen your salvation. What does Jesus mean? He shall say it. He has seen God's salvation. He has seen, he shall say it. But you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. The name Simeon means listener. Simeon was a listener. So when guests come into our home, we generally want to catch up, right? And we, and they want to tell us what's going on. And so the question is, are we going to listen to each other? And as hosts, will we listen to them as they're telling us? It's a great gift to listen. A lot of the time, they say something, and we want to say something, and they say something, and we want to say something, and they want to say something. And sometimes we're so busy balancing that, well, we don't, we're not even listening <laughs> Or what they're saying, we're just listening for them to take a breath so we can jump in. But here we have Luke focusing on the listener. Simeon is listening to the people who come to the temple every day. He was listening for the future. He was listening for hope, the consolation of Israel. He was listening that which would bring peace, that which would bring light. He was listening day after day in the temple. What did he hear? He heard the cries of the people. He heard the songs of, of the prayers, the loud, happy, celebratory ones that seemed so loud and brash, but good-hearted anyway. He heard the ritual ones, spoken sometimes as though they had lost their meaning. And sometimes as though the meaning was so deep, it resonated through the souls of those who prayed. He heard the wordless prayers that were kept, that were wept from swollen and reddened eyes, wrung out twisted scraps of cloth between hands, gnawed or gnawed with pain and fear. He heard the proud and grateful prayers of people who knew how blessed they were. He heard them and wept he heard them and wept and laughed with them. He heard them. But he heard more because he listened deeply. He heard the responses. He heard the sighs of the Spirit as it flowed like wisps of comfort into the hearts of the hopeless and broken. He heard the soothing song of blessing as it played on hearts less in tune than his, but aware nonetheless. He heard the invitation of the God he loved to follow, to obey, to keep close and stay awake, to watch and listen. He heard the commandment not as a hammer on a cymbal, but as a finger plucking a string. He listened, he heard. And on this day, Mary and Joseph, David, Jesus, on this day, 
He heard the music shift into a higher key, a note of anticipation. He heard the presence of God in a baby, in the peasant parents. He heard And the listener, sinner, became the singer. And he sang a song. He sang a song into the hearts of those who came carrying more than they knew. His song was a gift. Having heard all the stories, having been blessed by all the, the stories, He now blesses with a song. Now let your servant depart in peace. It's time for someone else to take over. Some people say that he was talking about his own death. Could be. But more importantly, What he may have been saying is, I've heard the voice of the one who sings the song of salvation, who chants the choruses of freedom. And my ears are full. I am at peace. Just like Isaiah said, the word vindication has a direct relationship to the word He may be done listening, he may be done singing, but he has to teach the song to those who will sing it. He has to teach the deaf how to listen, how to teach the blind how to see. Now, deafness doesn't mean that we can't hear the words, it means we don't hear the words. Blindness doesn't mean we can't see, it means we won't see. Spirit rested on Simeon. Rested, not wrestling, not shaking. Rested, that's the sign of peace. What does it mean to be perfectly peace? Jesus said, My peace I give unto you, not as the world give do I give, do not let your heart be troubled. What does it mean to be at peace? It means to stand in that place where heaven and earth are so intertwined that we cannot tell the difference. Another image is the garden of Eden. Plenty of images and metaphors. And until that spirit rests on us, until we are able and willing to feel peace, to experience peace, to be peace, we are not at peace. We are conflicted. But those who are at peace have a privilege and have a responsibility they are blessed, to bless and to offer peace to others, to encourage peaceful behaviors to others, to invite others to, to not put on just the clothes of peace, but to have inside the hearts, soul, mind, and strength of peace. Simeon was a sign. A sign for Mary and Joseph, just like Anna, the prophetess, Another old woman who spent a lot of time at the temple. Who not always had reason to, to shout and celebrate and bring glory to God. To celebrate the presence of God. But on this occasion, she was filled with such glory that she, according to Luke, she praised God. And spoke about the child, saying, watch him go out. The day will come when you will see him grow. And when he is grown, you will speak the word of God as you have never heard it spoken. Now 
If I was there, I'd probably say, okay, how long do I have to wait? I don't think she would answer me. She said, you'll know it when you hear it. You will know it when you see it. We are the sign. We have inherited those memories. We have invited company. And we have listened to their stories. And now, we see the story of grace and of peace and of welcome and of community. And we generally do that by inviting them to the table and say, let's eat. Let's share a common meal, a sacred meal. When everyone leaves, what do they talk about on the way home? They talk about what a good time. Now, if they talk about what a terrible time they had, they have rejected the gift of hospitality. Play acted so well while they were there. And as they talk about what a good time they had, they're already looking forward to the next time. And the kingdom begins to grow and grow and grow and grow. And we who were the company, who were being enjoyed, become the host to enjoy the company.
was in the garden, were you? I was in the stable, were you? I was at the tomb on Easter morning, were you? The places where heaven and earth intersect and become so intertwined that we cannot tell one from the other. What can I give? Give him my heart. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you have come, linking heaven to earth, divinity to flesh, and spiritual to temporal. Through the wonderful events of your birth, we are invited to see the heart, soul, mind, and strength of you, Lord, and how indeed you are working your purposes, the salvation of the world, out. As we remember our family and friends who carry great joy and great sorrow, we who have received you and listened to you, now speak to them, inviting them to listen to us as we speak the message of peace, hope, joy, and love that will light their way we thank you for the services here on Christmas Eve. We thank you for the miracles that took place before our very eyes. Thank you for wrestling with us and giving us blessing as the match was drawing to a close. We pray for the COVID pandemic as it affects our states, our city, our neighborhood. And in the midst of that, thank you for offering us as healing. As we proclaim the healing message of glory. Tragedies all around the world, successful things all around the world. That we gladly now, Lord, call to mind. As we spend a few moments with you, heart to heart. Mind to mind, soul to soul, trusting that you will hear our prayer. Thank you, O oh Lord. For we pause and we stand ready to acknowledge that you are the God of hope and joy. That we have been given such bounteous gifts that when we look at the gifts that we offer, at times they simply pale. When our minds try to grasp all that we have been given this season. Things like wholeness in our woundedness, hope in our despair, peace in our turmoil, forgiveness in our rebellion. Lord, like Simeon, our eyes have seen your salvation, and you give us light in our darkness. So, Lord, as we embrace your extravagant generosity, we dedicate ourselves to give well as we got. For we offer this prayer, we offer our gift, heart, soul, mind, and strength. In the Savior's holy name, for his sake. As we pray the prayer that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. Save us in the time of trial, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Simeon rejoiced. Anna rejoiced. I think it's time for us to rejoice. In just a moment, David's going to play a song of rejoicing. Good Christian men rejoice. I suppose we ought to say good Christian folk. With heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the grave. Jesus Christ was born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting home. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. So as we prepare to rejoice, receive a blessing. This blessing is from God to me, to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Depart with that assurance that God is with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say, amen. and amen. Let's stand and rejoice at a respectful distance from each other, of course. Go peace.